very latest on Patriots Chiefs tonight. Will there be a game? And did the Los Angeles Lakers just ask for trouble? And is that the man who's going to give it to them? All this with this panel. Clinton Yates, Israel Gutierrez, Pablo Torre, and Mr. Bob Ryan. Let's go. Last piece is definitely nice. So many wrote, right? It was, it's gone from over to on. That's tough, Bill. If he was here today, he'd be eating you. We'll get to that in a second. Patriots Chiefs kick off in two hours. The game will go on as of our tape time. How the NFL got here. Cam Newton testing positive Saturday. The Patriots having zero other positive tests. Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. The Patriots having two team flights from two different airports, one with the 20 players deemed in close contact with Newton, assuming that's the entire offensive huddle, and the other with the rest of the team. And all of that meeting league guidelines and protocol for a game. The NFL says they've looked at all the data, they've done all the tracing. Bob Ryan, I'm going to start with you. How does the NFL look here proceeding with a football game? Uh, greedy, uh, impulsive, uh, illogical, uh, stupid. Um, oh, how far do I go? Uh, how does this make any sense? The, the postponing by one day? May, I don't know what I'm missing here. Maybe I'm not too smart. Fine. I don't get it. I think it's, it's I, I, we understand why they're doing it, but the logic of them being allowed to get away with this by us is, is, does, escapes me. No, this game should not be being played. I don't care what they have to do down the road to manipulate a schedule. This is hasty and ill-advised. And, and I just, if and by the way it takes place, I'll believe it when I see that kickoff at 7.05 ET tonight and not before. Pablo Suri, how does the NFL look proceeding with this game? I feel similar to Bob. I mean, this is a gamble on personal safety, which is not new in the annals of NFL decision-making, to be sure. But there are a couple reasons, Tony, to be particularly worried about this from the perspective of what does our process suggest? What is the best process to take here? And number one, we know about incubation periods by now, or at the very least we should after seven months about talking about this virus, right? This is a thing that can emerge despite testing negative the first initial day or two. So they are not out of the woods yet. But the second thing is the whole notion of we're going to fly two different planes from two different airports at the point at which you're trying to resemble a bubble while not having anything close to a bubble that is now moving to another city, by the way, to play another team that had a practice squad quarterback, also test positive, it all begs, it honestly, it, like, why? Why? It begs all of the questions that Bob asked. Israel Gutierrez. Yeah, it looks to me like they will finish the season at all costs. And to everything that Pablo and Bob said were, were also true. But moving a, a little bit along here is, the Patriots themselves would have been better off if there were a number of people that were tested positive and not just Cam Newton, right? So a team like Tennessee gets to go ahead and delay and play their game later, but the Patriots have to force feed this game and play without their quarterback. That seems unfair. So it seems to me what the NFL is saying, we don't really care about the integrity of the season necessarily, just get it done. And this is the first slip up or the first, you know, mini outbreak or what have you. We assume there's going to be another one. So this just tells you what the, the sort of template is for the NFL. Hey, no negatives right now. We're going to play this. It doesn't matter if it's a Wednesday. Uh, no positives right now, I guess. It's, it, it, it's a negative when Sorry. you get a positive, but no positives other than Cam Newton right now. And I'll bring in Clinton Yates. The term that comes to mind is the term my mama used to use when I was cutting up and she knew it and I knew it, which is that the NFL is trying to be slick. They're insulting our intelligence with this entire method because they've already canceled games in other situations and put them in other spots. But this one, for whatever reason, has to go off with some Scooby-Doo level adventure in terms of getting people from one place to another. I'm sorry, I'm not buying it. It's just a clear indication that what matters more is getting this game off than health. It's a obvious statement to me, considering every single thing we see going on around the rest of this country, that they are not concerned about anything other than playing a marquee matchup football game because health be damned simply from what we've seen them do. It's just not possible to buy the best side of safety in this That's situation. That's what you if said you earlier, Clinton, Clinton, right? That this is a premier game. This is the defending champion. This is one of the it strongest was. fan bases. And, and, that's, and that's why we're moving forward, in your opinion, Clinton? 
I don't see any other reason why. And until I'm told otherwise, what else would I believe? And quite frankly, if you come out and say that, I have at least something to judge something on. But if you try to sneak it by me as if you're going to trick us into believing that this is safe, that's where I have a problem. And that's what seems to be what's happening right now. And it's not necessary. America understands too much, in my opinion, about what's going on with this pandemic to try to pull this one over. Pablo Torre. Yeah, the NFL is sort of engaging in what it often does, a certain level of self-identified exceptionalism. We don't have to be like the other non-bubbled sports. We're the NFL. We have the money, the power, the resources, the planes. We can make it happen. But just understand, when we see what baseball is doing, right, now bubbled in a postseason, by the way, when we see what college football has had to do with actually shrinking the schedule and distorting the schedule, getting down to conference games only, the NFL, if they're not careful here, is going to stumble backwards into a situation where they will have no high ground at all in terms of the integrity of the game and actually the strategy behind Last it. Last word, Bob Ryan. And there is a possibility they can crush an NBA finals game, uh, you know, uh, an NBA, uh, well, excuse me, baseball playoffs playoff starting, crushing baseball playoffs in, a, well, you in mean so in doing it. Don't and, think and, that doesn't enter into it. Okay. Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. It, it, it's just... Sports functions as a representation of a society that's functioning well. And the other prism this has to be viewed by is how we are naturally at this exact moment. We're going to move on. You're in trouble, which is what you guys wanted to call the last story. And it's what Jimmy Butler was saying to the Lakers at the end of last night's game. LeBron said it first to Butler at the end of the half. And that, of course, awakened the monster. That, that's Butler masterpiece last night. I'm going to ask you guys a trivia question. A 40-point triple-double in the finals. This is the third ever. Does anybody know who had the other two? LeBron, LeBron and has to have one of them. LeBron James and Jerry West. I heard it from Pablo. I heard it from Israel Gutierrez. I didn't hear it from Mr. Bob Ryan. Bob, I want to start with you. Well, I know what game it was. The seventh game in 19... Okay, well, thank you very much. <laughs> How did Butler do this, Bob? He did it by... De demonstrating something that I did not know was in him. The scoring I could see. I had no idea that he had that level of creativity with the ball in his hands. Those passes were worthy of any point guard you can name. He had more to be proud of, in my opinion, from the passing than he did from the scoring. And uh, by the way, he also did it. Oh, I'm so happy. I'm so proud of him. The first person not seven feet tall in the last 40 <laughs> plus years to score 40 points without the gimmick known as the three point shot. Oh my God, Jimmy Butler, you now become my favorite player. Okay. And are we talking about an all-time game here from Jimmy Butler that puts him in the pantheon of finals games, Bob? Uh, yes. Oh, absolutely. It's in a handful of greatest individual virtuoso performances in the history of the finals. It, yes. Israel, I'll go to you in Miami next. I want you to uh, reflect on Butler here. But also, there's another question just to load up on, guys. How could the Lakers and LeBron let this happen? Israel, next to you. I mean, when you talk about all-time great performances, Jimmy Butler needing the game of his life with two of his best three teammates gone, scored or assisted on 73 of Miami's points and had the greatest game of his career. In fact, you mentioned what he did with the 40-point triple-double. That sounds like now he has joined a short list of potential NBA logo uh, candidates there with Jerry West, LeBron James, and he as the only three who have done that. So that elevates him into this, this stratosphere of a great, of a superstar guy who can elevate his team. So now what it does going forward is makes you think, do they, not that they don't need Bam or Goron, but can Jimmy Butler call upon this more than one time in a series? Do the Lakers have to revise things and put a bunch of eyes on Jimmy Butler and not let him see the floor or see one-on-one -on -one very often? I think it does, it's a game changer for the series because it makes the Lakers have to think at least a little bit, especially if you potentially get Bam back in a game. Lynn, uh, can four. you start there and what the Lakers are thinking? And again, how could the Lakers and LeBron let this happen? Lakers had a bad game. They had nine turnovers last game. They had seven in the first quarter alone, just to leading up, and LeBron did, just leading up to start the game. You come in sometimes, it's the NBA Finals, and sometimes the other team has it more. Jimmy Butler had the performance of a lifetime, and AD apparently forgot how to play basketball. I'm willing to give the Heat that much of a chance if it's going to happen that way and give them one game. I didn't panic after they lost the first one by a blowout. I'm not going to panic on the Lakers' side for this one either. The Heat are a formidable opponent, even injured. Jimmy Butler shows you why he's the toughest man in the league. I'm not worried about this at all. I think they got a game they deserved in this series, and we got a great performance out of a great Well player. said. I don't think anyone's suggesting panic for the Lakers, but just the idea you, you lose a game where 50% of the offense is off the court for Miami. Pablo Torre, Plaschke wrote today that the Lakers quit. Is that what you watched? 
I did not see quitting, even though LeBron James walked off the floor literally before the game was over. That was a bad look. I get where Plashke and his hot taking wisdom is coming from on that. But let's look at what the Lakers have to do in this next game, Tony. Jimmy Butler was attacking one on one. He had a chisel in his hand and went down to the other basket every single time, basically by himself. And the reason he got to do that, weirdly enough, is because Bam was out. Bam being out meant they could spread the entire floor. So the Heat had a coaching adjustment here. They said, we're going to spread it out, let Jimmy attack the middle, and let him create a box score. And I don't know if Bob Ryan has tattoos, but getting that box score with no three-pointers <laughs> and 40 points and a triple-double, Bob, I feel like that is in your future. Oh, too. gosh. Bob, back in, please. Uh, no, no tattoos. I'm really? sorry, but let oh, me say this about my good friend, Mr. Plasky. Hey, Bill, they had 10 turnovers, not seven in the first quarter. They had two double-digit deficits. They erased and were leading by one point with nine minutes to go. How do you say they quit? Stop it. Israel? To answer your question, Tony, or I don't know if this is even answering it, but yeah. I feel like the only way the Lakers could have allowed Jimmy Butler to do this was if they didn't think he could do it because he was the only guy you have to stop on this team. Say what you will about Tyler Hero in that one big game in the Eastern Conference Finals. He is stoppable, okay? Jimmy Butler, they looked at it and said, okay, go ahead and go one-on-one. -on -one. We won't double you, not even after halftime, not even in the fourth quarter. Just go get it your It wasn't even throws. double. It was, it was LeBron switching off. Wasn't LeBron switching off? I saw Slater tweet this today, and I looked at the plays. Caldwell Pope is the man on Butler in crunch time the last four minutes, Clinton. Can we get some love for the lost art of the dramatic walk-off to make a point to the people around you? I'm oh, you're completely talking about fine that? with LeBron no, wait, doing wait, 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 this. To simply <laughs> say, okay. this is not how I wanted this to go. I know, go. Bob Pay Ryan. I know, Bob. Bob, you're going to disagree with that. There was nine seconds left. LeBron's walking off the court. And it becomes noticed because there's a shot clock violation. And then you hear, we can't go on without five men on the court. What did LeBron <laughs> Something or nothing, Bob? Well, the good thing is you got my BC guy, Jared Dudley, into the game. It was classless. <laughs> and I think Adam classless. Silver should give him a phone call and remind him, you're the face of the league. We can't have that. Please, you're better than that, LeBron. Stop it. Classless. Clinton. I don't disagree with that. Oh, you don't? I don't disagree okay. with that last part. <laughs> no, no. But you were in favor of it, but you don't disagree with that it was classless? What's, what's happening Yes. Here? If LeBron James <laughs> walks off the court, it means your team needs to be playing Bob, better. Bob, you sure Big you don't have a mermaid tattoo that does a little dance when you flex your forearm? I, I think you might have that. <laughs> Coming up, fire sell the most amazing thing about the Cowboys' number 30 ranked defense. That is not number 32. We'll be back. Yeah. <laughs> Dallas Cowboys knocked out of first place in the NFC East by the Eagles last night. And by the fact they're 1-3 and three and their defense stops nobody. The 49-38 loss to Cleveland. Let's talk about both teams. But first, Dallas, Dak Prescott on pace for 6,700 yards. It means nothing because their defense is dreadful, Clinton Yates. What is the deal with Dallas right now? The problem is that when you're giving up 300 odd yards on the ground, you never have the daggone football in order to be able to score it. They're second to last in the league in terms of what time of possession is, and that's creating a problem for their offense. They can't seem to punch in it. They never got the ball. It's Rick Gutierrez. The offense by the final score doesn't seem to be ever the problem. I think Mike McCarthy was just put up in a tough situation where, you know, he turned the turnover on the defensive <laughs> side was pretty large from last oh, is year. Is that right? Year. So that means, you know, he's got to adjust. Uh, and, you know, they picked up Ha Ha Clinton Dix, but he's been on, what, four teams in three years now. Let Byron Jones go to Miami. Personnel's not exactly the same here. It's probably the biggest reason and the only reason. I Israel, I want you to remember what you said about a coach and you think he could get up to a podium and say, you know, I had a tough time with the turnaround we had from the roster we had because that might come up later in the story. Pablo Torre, right. how about you? The Cowboys did not only give up 300 plus yards rushing to the Browns, they gave it up to a Browns team that lost its number one rusher, Nick Chubb, in the first half. On top of that, Dak Prescott, yes, it's incredible how many yards he has, but it truly is meaningless given the defensive problems. Bob Ryan? My friends here have outlined the issue. Let me tell you, there used to be a term in boxing called the trial horse in which your young and up-and-coming contender would be put in against an old-timer that sounded good, the public thought he was good, and you knew that you could beat him. And then you look good on your resume that you beat the trial horse. The Cowboys are now a trial horse. Congratulations, Browns. Wow. <laughs> uh, this is like a, it's a lesson. It's an education every time you're on, Bob. That would make the rest of the NFC East for another boxing term tomato cans, so it really doesn't matter until you get to week 16 and week 17. Cleveland, they've scored 35, 34, 49 the last three weeks. They haven't done that in 52 years. 
is real. What are we seeing from the Browns? Is this for real? It's almost as if they unlock this running game and realize, oh, we can throw it now because we've got such a great running game, and oh, we have this guy number 13. To see him just go off in a game always feels good because it feels like wasted talent. Pablo? But hold on, they are beating up on the tomato cans Tony mentioned, the Washington football team, right the week before that, the Bengals. So yes, get the ball to Jarvis Landry and Odell Beckham, that's great. But also, I'm gonna pump the brakes on how back they are. We'll move on. Buy or sell two. Tampa 38, Chargers 31. L.A. was up 17 early. Look at some of these throws from Justin Herbert, the rookie. Tom Brady, not a rookie. His last 15 passes, he was 14 of 15, 223 and four touchdowns. That was after another pick six from him to start the game. Israel, is that the sound of Tampa finally clicking? I mean, maybe in a half you could say they've clicked. He's also thrown, Tom, what, four pick sixes in his last, like, seven games, I believe. So I think he's yeah. got a little bit to figure out also. However, um, yeah, that's exactly what you want to look for. Even when you have your receivers not completely healthy, you have that type of performance from your quarterback. That's what Pablo? Rumors of Tom Brady's demise have been greatly exaggerated. This team looks like the best team in the division. He had three touchdowns against the Broncos last week. He's been pretty darn good. And the fact is, we like to laugh at how much he's not his old self, but the new self is actually quite good. So you just put the brakes on the Browns, even though we just said Tampa beat the Broncos and they just beat the Chargers yesterday. Bob Ryan, how about you? At halftime, uh, he was averaging under five yards per pass attempt after a dismal second quarter. But he looked much better in the second half. He's had moments this year, so far. Moments, that was a very big, one little thing, little hidden little thing. Gronkowski finally made a Gronkowski play. Finally, if he's gonna be able to play anywhere near that, that's gonna help them even more in the long run. See why? And right before halftime, the Chargers gave up the ball, allowing them to get, to get back in that game and getting the Bucks back on track. They blew that game. But the story here is Justin Herbert. He won the starting job with that first daggone touchdown pass. The second one, everybody was wondering if Tyrod was going to be on a bus out of town because this kid is that good. I'm telling you, Anthony Lynn might have found a way to lose this game, but Herbert is a ball player. Watch that kid for sure coming on out. Fire still three, a record you didn't even know they keep. Six straight losses while having a double-digit lead. The Lions, this is unbelievable. And here's Matt Patricia after the game. Uh, I know we got a lot of work to do. Um, certainly, I think when I came to Detroit, there was a lot of work to do, and that's what we're trying to do. Those comments had Jim Caldwell's name trending nationally, Pablo. What are we talking about here? He is talking about the theater of work, a pencil for a laminated play sheet, a record that is underwhelming given what he inherited. None of it adds up. We don't believe him. He needs more people, Tony. <laughs> Bob Ryan? He needs a dose of humility. I don't know who he really, who he, I think I know who he thinks he is. He used to work for that guy. Well, he's not that guy. And he's done nothing to earn anything but scorn in Detroit. But Yates. Incorrect. Caldwell was better than him. Inappropriate. He got run out on a reel when he shouldn't have and his players liked him. And as a fellow pencil pusher, idiotic on top of that. Get your life together, Patricia. Israel Gutierrez. <laughs> is this where I get cornered here because I gave uh, yes, Mike McCarthy in the fact, excuse it and I don't give Matt Patricia is. the excuse? <laughs> Matt Patricia has been there longer. He can't use yes, that excuse. Yeah. McCarthy just got there. Yeah. It just looks bad for you. It's, you know, it's the timing of it all. Oh, Israel, you are into the showdown. And now you're going the wrong way. Pablo Torre got passed by Clinton Yates in the right lane there. Yates and Bob Ryan in showdown. Check this out. Joe Burrow gives his game ball back after his first win. We'll talk about it next. Baseball, Clinton Yates, Bob Ryan. Division series. Feels like just last week we were in the wild card round. Astros A's, Yankees Rays, Marlins Braves, Padres Dodgers. There is history and blood in all of these matchups. Clinton Yates, most compelling? It's got to be Padres Dodgers for me. The expectations are sky high for the blue, and the Padres are the most exciting team in the league, and they're already clearly proven that they can beat them. Bob Ryan? I'm waiting for the first high and tight pitch either way in the Astros and A's, particularly with the Astros, the most hated team in America. Oh, absolutely. That's the one and I'm Mike looking Fires for. Fires on the other side in Oakland. There's no wrong answer here. There is, there is just great, <laughs> great, compelling 
impactful storylines in each series. We're going to move on, split the point. Getting the game ball for your first NFL win, but putting it back in the ball bag on purpose. Joe Burrow said it's a great ball. I, I want it next week. Bob, is that gritty or too gritty? It's just, it's crazy. It's incomprehensible. I mean, what is he? It's silly. What, what's he trying to prove? You don't do that. Football snow. Ah, this is a football it. I would have Sorry. loved to see go to his high school that he told us so much about when he came into the league as far as who he is as a dude. You don't got to throw it back in there. Give it to the people. Spread the love, Joe B. That's why we like you. I didn't, I didn't consider that, but oh, yes, Clinton Yates. I, I'm, I'm here for that. That's a point. That's a FaceTime, Mr. Yates. I'd like to pay tribute to the life of Bob Gibson. He was my father's favorite pitcher, and as a result, I'm going to read to you the text that my dad sent me when he passed. He said, he saw a batter's daring to crowd the plate as professionally and personally disrespectful and immediately moved him off the plate with some not-to-be-understood, misunderstood chin music. Bob Gibson was a legend, and here's a crazy stat. In 1968, he completed 28 games as a pitcher. He started 34. You know what happened in the other six? He didn't get taken out for a pitcher once. He was pinch hit for every time. It's the most amazing stat in all of baseball. Never forget that. Incredible. Wow. And he started his career as a Harlem Globetrotter. Before baseball. Unbelievable. This is for Bob Gibson right here. Some chim music.